Welcome back. We are going to proceed with our next session. However, uh, before we do, just some a very quick Im but important housekeeping note. Uh, tomorrow, there is going to be a trip to KAUST, uh, to the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. However, in order to gain access to KAUST, you must go to the registration desk and give uh, those who are standing there either your national ID number, your ECAMA number, or your passport number. So if you would like to go to KAUST, that trip will be tomorrow at 9 a.m., please make sure that you go to the registration desk during the lunch break in order to pass along that information to them. Our next panel will be a discussion of GFCC cases, and it's going to be moderated by the very flexible Dr. Hatem Saman. Joining him will be Mr. Connor Hand, the Assistant Principal at the National Competitiveness Councils of Ireland, and Mr. Owen Chang, Research Associate at the Korea Economic Research Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have really uh, two interesting uh, GFCC cases today. So we have Ireland, uh, a small open economy, um, which uh, in, in order to hone its competitiveness, it needs to further develop its infrastructure at competitive prices. Uh, in this case study, presented by Mr. Connor Hand, we discuss public funding, prioritizing investment, and the role of cities in driving uh, competition. Now, Mr. Chang will, will give us an overview of uh, Korea's uh, intelligent uh, transport systems, or ITS. Uh, the ITS is considered an important growth engine capable of generating uh, considerable uh, sizes of jobs and exports. Uh, it makes great contributions to uh, sharpening the nation's competitive edge by developing a variety of uh, ITS technology and providing uh, ITS uh, services. There, I think there are lessons to be learned from these two uh, cases for Saudi Arabia and really for the rest of the world. So, Mr. Connor. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as I said, or as we're here today, I, I really hope to share some of the Irish experience in terms of infrastructure development. Uh, we're somewhat of a unique country, I guess, uh, amongst this audience in that, as we've already discussed, we're a small open economy. Uh, we've developed our infrastructure stock relatively quickly, uh, beginning in the 1980s, I guess, with uh, large-scale investments in, some tele in telecoms infrastructure then throughout the 90s in terms of transport infrastructure, and then moving into the, this millennium in terms of R&D infrastructure. Uh, so I'm, hopefully we can, we can learn something from our experience as an adaptive small open economy. Uh, just by way of background, uh, I'm actually here representing the Irish National Competitiveness Council. I guess we were one of the first competitiveness councils established in Europe in, in 1997. So we do have a long history of actually talking about these issues, uh, reflecting on them, and trying to influence policy. Uh, we report directly to our Prime Minister, through our Minister for Jobs and Enterprise, which gives us very good access to, to the wider political system. Because it's important to note that we're an advisory body. We don't actually implement policy ourselves. So really, for us to achieve something, we have to make our message as clear as possible. We have to set out very clear case studies, very clear arguments in favor of what we want to do, and really try to influence an agenda and bring large numbers of government departments and agencies with us. Uh, to do that, I guess, our membership uh, is, is a very powerful tool. Uh, while the Secretariat and Research is provided by the civil service, most of our members are actually private sector members. So the heads of large companies in Ireland, such as Google, PayPal, uh, those sorts of companies that really carry, carry huge impact in the political system. So when we say something, it's the voice and the weight of our members behind us that really carries that impact. Also, we, we use our position within the wider framework of government to, to really drive action as well. Uh, so nine key government uh, senior civil servants sit on our council, not as members, but as advisors. So they can tell the council certain actions are uh, feasible, some are not, and here's the political situation. And meanwhile, they can also take back the messages from the council to the key economic ministries within government. And I think that gives us a very powerful two-way conversation between the private sector and the, the wider political system. 
We also have direct access to our cabinet committees. There's a cabinet committee on infrastructure and another, another cabinet committee on economic renewal uh, chaired by our prime minister. So we would regularly take our reports into those sorts of forums and really put, push forward our, our, our arguments. I think the final thing that I'd like to say about the, the, the council itself is it is independent. And again, that gives it some real weight in terms of its, its conclusions. It's not part of the system, but it's, it's linked very closely to the system. But that independent voice gives us credibility, uh, which is underpinned by the research that we undertake. So driving, driving in here today, or yesterday, I was really struck by the challenge of talking about infrastructure in an Irish context in Saudi Arabia. As I said, we're, we're a very small economy. Um, this slide really just, I'm just really trying to put it, I suppose, put some perspective on where Ireland is coming from vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia, vis-a-vis -vis the US. As you can see, our population is 4.6 million. I compare that to the 30 million approximately in Saudi Arabia, 316 million in the US. Uh, you can see as well the size of our economy. We are a small economy, a uh, total GDP of about 220 billion. So numbers that I'm talking about, which seem large in an Irish context, probably to this audience, uh, blend into to, um, somewhat insignificance, I guess, uh, by comparison. Having said that, we're a trading economy. Uh, we're a very open economy. Approximately 105 to 110 percent of GDP is accounted for by exports. So having the appropriate infrastructure set up is absolutely crucial if we were to get our goods and services to market. Maybe a, a little bit about the, the Irish context. I've already mentioned that we developed quite rapidly in the 1980s and 1990s through large-scale investment in, in key infrastructure. But I guess more recently, uh, and on, probably similar to most countries in the world, we've been adversely affected by the economic recession, um, financial ba and banking crisis, and also a very, a very severe domestic housing problem as well. I suppose from an Irish perspective, the good news is we, we are now in a very strong recovery. Uh, we're seeing exports have picked up, consumption, investment, uh, all of the key attributes that are driving growth are now very favourable from an Irish perspective, and we're probably the fastest growing economy in Europe. So I think what this does is it gives us a window to actually look at infrastructure again and to really put, put, the, put some real effort into actually maximizing our infrastructure. Um, in terms of the timing, the, this, this forum is actually a, a very convenient timing. We've just published our latest capital development plan, which sets out the, the framework for spending between 2000 and, or 2016 to 2021. So I guess you know, the, all of these issues are, are to the fore of our thinking at the moment as well. I suppose there, there's one other aspect that is probably worth mentioning in terms of an infrastructure context for Ireland. As much as we would like to, to spend what we can on, on infrastructure, we're also constrained by a number of external rules. As a member of the European Union, there's a whole series of rules determining how much we can borrow, how much we can spend, and at what pace expenditure can grow. So we do have to maintain some sort of fiscal sense uh, while also trying to maximise investment. So, what this capital plan looks at, I suppose first and foremost, it, it actually recognises that there are gaps in, in our infrastructure stock. Um, these are reflected uh, in a whole series of international publications from the WEF and the IMD that recognise despite large-scale investment over recent decades, there are still gaps, there are still bottlenecks that these need to be addressed. Uh, the, the capital plan primarily looks at the state expenditure. There, in, in, in infrastructure. There's obviously a very important private sector dimension, but most of my comments today will really be focusing on, on the public sector investment. Uh, the, the capital plan deals with not just physical infrastructure. Uh, we've put a huge emphasis on the R&D side of, of investment as well, and I think human capital, all of these aspects are included in the plan. So essentially the plan encompasses 42 billion euros worth of expenditure. Um, as I said to us, that's, that's a massive figure. It, it's somewhat dwarfed by the figures uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, 27 billion of this will come directly from the, cap, from the public purse, uh, 14 billion through various state-owned enterprises. Um, and then there is an element of PPP on top of this as well. Uh, it covers a, a vast range of, of aspects, uh, almost 10 billion on transport infrastructure, 4 billion on environmental infrastructure, a range of supports for enterprise, a range of supports for education, health, and agriculture. Um, I think while there has been an increase in the capital allocation, it is somewhat modest. Uh, the, the chart there on the right-hand side of the, the slide really just shows that from the peak of expenditure in the, the mid-2000s, uh, we had a fairly significant drop in expenditure as a result of the recession. 
this capital plan goes some way towards addressing that deficit, but I think from a National Competitiveness Council perspective, we would certainly like to see a lot more done. I guess, you know, why are we looking for more money to be spent? Um, really, what I'm looking at here is a number of countries of comparable size, of comparable wealth, just to see what are they actually investing from the public sector in terms of infrastructure. So there's a range of countries, uh, primarily European countries here, as I said, similar enough GDP, similar enough GDP per capita. But you can see from this chart that despite all of the investment in recent years, in terms of the public purse, we're still spending a lot less than some of our key competitors. When you think about uh, the gap that exists in infrastructure, the, the council are very much putting forward a case that what we're spending is welcome, but it isn't sufficient. Uh, we, we've run the numbers, uh, we've looked at uh, how much we do need to spend, and the, the types of figures that we're looking at now that we are spending will really only be sufficient to maintain the existing transport infrastructure stock. So if we want to actually close the gap, more is required. Um, I guess competitiveness, you're, you're always looking outside your own borders. It's always a, a, a degree of competition between ourselves and our key trading partners. So closing that gap is absolutely essential for Irish economic prosperity. I suppose, again, because the Council cannot actually implement policy, because we're an advisory body, we really have to, to encourage government uh, officials, government departments and ministers to actually take action. So in terms of doing that, we really set out a case as to why infrastructure matters. All of these arguments are probably well known, there, there's nothing particularly original in them, but I think coming from the, the National Competitiveness Council perspective, having that independent voice and having that weight of private sector uh, commentary behind it really gives force to our arguments. So as I said, nothing particularly surprising about why, why we're pushing for more investment. It's, it's really around addressing the competitiveness bottlenecks that exist. Uh, we've seen as the economy has picked up, uh, congestion in some of our major cities has already becoming an issue. Uh, this, this is, as a, as a trade-dependent economy, it's absolutely vital that we can get our goods to market quickly and efficiently. So that's, that's one reason to, to invest. Uh, secondly, uh, we're experiencing fairly rapid population growth as well. Um, this is primarily driven by uh, relatively high birth rates compared to a lot of our European peers, but also large-scale inward migration, uh, targeted high-skilled migration. Uh, so by 2046, we're estimating that the population will increase from 4.6 million to somewhere between 5 and 6.7 million. So that's, that's quite a challenge for, for a small economy to deal with. We also, despite being a small economy, have quite a powerful uh, regional uh, program as well. Uh, so regional politics, regional uh, action plans really drive a lot of our infrastructure agenda. Um, I guess high-speed broadband is a particularly important uh, issue for the regions. So even though we're a small country, uh, we do want to encourage people to be able to find jobs, to encourage investment, to develop enterprises of scale throughout the, the, the country. So access to high-speed broadband is abs absolutely essential given the types of, of services and, and industries that we're engaged in. I guess governments can often be reluctant to, to take independent advice. So really, uh, one, of the, one of the mechanisms that we're using to encourage implementation of some of our recommendations is to identify existing targets that government have already signed up to and address and relate our recommendations to those existing targets. For instance, Ireland is, uh, has already committed to achieving 2.5% of GNP expenditure or R&D by 2020. That is a government target, it is accepted, but if we don't actually invest sufficiently from the public purse in R&D, we won't make that target. So this isn't a target that the National Competitiveness Council set. It's an externally driven target that government have already signed up to. Similarly, at a regional level, the government have already set out employment targets at each of the eight regional, regional levels. We're saying we agree with those targets, we support them, but unless the capital investment to roll out broadband to these regions is progressed, we won't actually meet those targets. So that's one approach I think that has been quite useful in terms of driving, driving implementation. I guess the final aspect of our approach is really to not just say we need more investment, but to get quite specific in terms of what type of investment we need. So probably, again, very few surprises in terms of the types of infrastructure that we're focusing on. Um, these are common to pretty much all economies. But we've got into very, very detailed levels in terms of uh, individual road projects, uh, individual rollout of broadband in, in very specific regions. So we, we have a lot of detail behind uh, these, these priorities. So first up, urban transport, particularly in Dublin, the capital city. Um, it is the main driver of growth in the, in the economy. 
Um, so we really want to make sure that people and goods can be moved within the city very quickly, and it obviously has a huge impact on quality of life. Interurban transport is also a, a second priority. A, we spent so much money in the 1990s on in motorways, on highways, um, but really we need to finish, to get the full return on that investment, we actually need to finish the network. So the network was developed, it's, it's largely there, but there are a couple of key spots that we need to complete to actually maximise the use of that. I've already mentioned uh, telecommunications, uh, Ireland as a, as a major ICT hub, this is absolutely vital. It's vital, as I said already, as well for our regional targets for employment. Water services, uh, we do have a lot of water in Ireland, but unfortunately the infrastructure is somewhat weak. Uh, there's problems in terms of leakage, uh, wastage of water. And given some of the sectors that we actually are, exp are, are trying to prioritise, particularly pharmaceuticals, uh, food sciences, water is an absolutely essential input to those services. So we're putting a big, big emphasis on making sure that we deliver quality water to the right places. And then probably a, a somewhat different aspect is the area of housing. Um, we had a domestic housing boom in the 2000s. It contrib hugely contributed to some of our economic problems. Uh, there are still issues in terms of the supply of housing in the right areas. So we're really emphasising that housing, wage costs and ultimately competitiveness are intimately linked. So then moving on a little bit just to, to briefly talk about cities. Um, and why they matter for competitiveness. The, the councils actually work, work on cities emerged out of a dialogue about regional competitiveness and spatial planning. Ireland traditionally is quite a, a rural uh, country. Um, we, we put a lot of emphasis on, on the regions, but almost to the extent that uh, there is, there's a competing uh, set of interests between Dublin, the capital city, and the rest of the country. Um, most people at, at the dialogue that I'm talking about were really focusing on how do we get more investment in the regions. And I think the council were one of the first organisations to say, well, yes, the regions are important, but cities are actually the key drivers of growth. Um, and I think we were trying to really counter the sense of ambivalence that cities don't matter. Cities do matter. And we also wanted to put forward the idea that it's not if cities win, the rest of the country loses. So it's, it's putting forward a, ca a case that Everybody wins by investing in cities. Everybody wins by having an attractive, efficient city that's world-class and that can attract the, the right skills. And I guess the, the bullet point there is saying that the challenge is not about redist redistri the redistribution of resources between, between Dublin and the rest of the economy. It's recognising that Dublin and the other key cities are primary drivers of growth. So really, we set out four key cornerstones of a, of a competitive city. Um, at a very high level, and we can probably talk about these more in, in the discussion, uh, that's about having the right sectoral mix, the right enterprise environment that actually allows high-tech, high-value city or companies to grow and prosper in, in a city. It's about connectivity, and that's really around the infrastructure, particularly access in terms of airports, broadband, as I've already mentioned. And then maybe two softer sides to it, the sustainability aspect, uh, making sure that planning, that planning is appropriate, not just that we can plan properly and, and deliver infrastructure quickly, but that we actually deliver a sustainable infrastructure that enhances the final bullet point, uh, the attractiveness of the city, inclusiveness, making sure that both for Irish people who are living in the city, but also the high-skilled migrants that we want to attract in, that the cities offer a very attractive quality of life. So I can maybe talk a little bit more uh, in the discussion about some of these policy aspects, but I would emphasize that for, for Ireland, one of the things that we're trying to do is build on the existing infrastructure that we have. We're not necessarily looking to, to build cities out of nothing. Um, you know, we're a small economy, uh, so it's really about maximizing the competitive advantages that we already have and making sure that we continue to, to invest and continue to develop and continue to deliver the most, uh, I suppose, pro-enterprise regime that we can possibly deliver. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. Owen, would you like to go? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Owen Chen from Korea Economic Research Institute. I'm a researcher associate. Uh, it is my pleasure to give a presentation today. 
um, on the topic of intelligent transportation system in Korea, uh, prepared by the Korea Economic Research Institute. Uh, first of all, let me, let me start with uh, the little background of the ITS services in Korea. Um, due to our rapid urbanization and economic growth, the number of the registered vehicles uh, the, group, the increase is significantly since 1970s. Uh, however, uh, the growth rate of the new roads couldn't keep pace, couldn't keep up pace with it. Uh, statistically, uh, from 1994 to uh, 2012, the number of uh, registered vehicles is uh, went up by 155 uh, percent, while the length of the road increased by only about 50, uh, 40 percent. So it becomes a problem. So tra traffic congestion costs. Uh, it used to be a 12.5 US uh, billion US dollars in 1994, but it went up to uh, 29 billion US dollars in 2010. As you can see the, 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 the graph at the, at the bottom that uh, the, how, how the, the registered vehicles in Korea is went up and the traffic congestion cost is going up. So next, so therefore uh, development of ITS becomes necessary. So. Uh, advanced traffic signal control systems and express uh, traffic management systems, we consider that an uh, early form of the ITS, but actually we can break, uh, break down into uh, three phases. Uh, the, the phase one before 2000, which is we can call it the beginning of the ITS project, uh, implementing fundamental infrastructure for ITS services. The phase two is from 2001 to 2010, the activation of the ITS project, the focusing on the development and expansion of the IT services. The phase three from 2011 to uh, 2020 is an is ongoing project and enhancement of the ITS technologies, the concentrating on the provision of the advanced and sophisticated IT services and introduction of the new IT services such as CITS. I will talk about the uh, ITS master plan. The very first national ITS master plan was established by the government in uh, uh, 1997. And after that, the Traffic System Efficiency Act that was passed in 1999. And the national ITS master plan for 21st century was uncovered by the government in 2001. And since then, the var various ITS services such as electronic the toll collection system, the bus information system, and the public transportation car system was uh, uh, gained the popularity, popularity and implemented. As you can see, the, you can see the T-Money card, which is one of the examples for the bus information system. So people can use their car to, to use the public the bus transportation. So they can deposit their money into it. So without the case, they're using only their card for their public transportation usage. The high pass is another example for electronic toll collection system. Now, coordination and collaboration for the ITS project. The, basically, ITS master plan advised the government uh, and private sector for establishing the ITS. And more than 40 authorities are engaged, the, including the Ministry of Science and Technology and the Ministry of the Commerce, Industry, Energy, and et cetera. Budget for the ITS master plan. Um, the investment were to be funded by the central and the local government and, uh, and as well as the private sector. The average annual budget for the ITS plan was $0.23 billion from 2001 to 2010. So there, will be the, there, was a, there were three uh, significant achievements through the ITS services we, the Korea promoted. The first one is an improvement in traffic congestion, of course. Um, statistically, tra tra traffic congestion cost itself steadily increased from 2000 to 2008, but the cost as a percent of the GDP actually decreased, 3.4% in 2000, but it went down to 2.8% in 2008. So it reached 11.8 uh, trillion Korean won in the words of the social benefit, and average traffic uh, speed on the road actually decreased by around 18%. The second achievement is an increase in the use of the public transportation. So 
the model share of the public transportation actually went up from 36.8% to the 42%, as you can see on the table, from 2003 to 2013. The final achievement I can address is an overseas export of the ITS. So the Korea strengths areas for ITS is uh, considered the real-time traffic information provision, electronic toll collection, and the provision of the ITS services in public transportation. So since 2006, Korea was able to export their strengths in ITS services to other uh, many other countries, such as China, Latin America, Southeast Asia, the United States, and European countries. Uh, I can mention the, some of the company that uh, who's uh, exporting their services to uh, many different countries. It's one of them is the LG CNS. They're exporting the automatic fare collection system to uh, China, which is considered the, one of the largest market in the world. Um, and LG CNS is a subsidiary of the second largest manufacturing company in Korea, LG. And I can. I can bring the Samsung SDS, who's exporting automatic fare collection system to India, also considered one of the largest market in the, in the world. So for uh, more to be done, um, the overall transport transportation system has been improved significantly, but still, traffic accident morality is uh, still high. So somehow we need to find a way to improve the ability to control the unexpected situation on the road. The secondly is an operational problem. The Korea need to uh, train uh, professional ITS personnel more efficiently and set up the standard manual for the operation procedure. At also the same time, we, we need to uh, secure the enough number of the, the, the expert on the, for the ITS services. The finally, uh, Korea need to uh, promote ITS technology and strategy R&D plan through uh, academics, industry, cooperation for the future of the ITS services. So, so this is pretty much it for today. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Um, we, we, I know we're out of time, but uh, I'll, uh, five minutes. I'll ask uh, one question to Owen and then to Connor, and then I'll open uh, uh, the stage up for uh, questions. Uh, Owen, there's something that you mentioned that was really interesting uh, for me. That you mentioned that. Um, 40 authorities were involved, uh, you know, in the coordination and collaboration of the ITS project. I really am interested in the lessons that we can learn from that and how can, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia benefit from, if there are any lessons, uh, you know, to be learned from that. So main reason why uh, we had a, such a strong engagement with the 40 different authorities for uh, our IT services, because the government had a clear direction clear guideline for that, uh, the development of the IT services. So basically, um, the government drew up the IT guideline on the specific areas, the roles of the each area and interest parties related to the project for the ITS. Mm -hmm. So the areas whose roles were very accurately prescribed in the guideline, uh, such as uh, planning, construction, standardization, <coughs> operation and management, performance evaluation, and effective analysis. So main theme is, uh, main point is uh, having a clear guideline for IT services, which is help uh, attract a lot of agencies coming to play. At the same time, they are willing to engage more accurately, and they know what, what kind of responsibility each one is has. Thank you. Uh, Connor, just uh, one question. Um, about cities, uh, you, what should we really look for as a, pol as a policymaker? What should a policymaker look for when planning to put cities on the competitiveness uh, map? Um, I'm thinking more like considerations for comparative advantages and the like. Can you talk a little bit about that? Actually, in some ways, my, my answer isn't dissimilar to the previous answer in that one of Ireland's key advantages is as a small economy, as a small country, uh, we can connect agencies very closely together, they can work together. Uh, so in terms of planning, uh, the right people can sit down with the enterprise sector if need be, needs be. Uh, we have a number of different enterprise development agencies who all have people on the ground who can assist with companies. Okay. Uh, so the policy coordination aspect is, is one 
very important thing. Um, I guess more generally, uh, regulation is, is hugely important. Uh, Ireland has put an awful lot of effort into making sure that you know we perform as well as possible in the World Bank doing business uh, report, for instance. Uh, all of these things, they contribute to the pro-enterprise environment. Uh, we, we deliberately design actions to improve our rankings, to make it easier for business. Um, similarly, in terms of migration policy, we have deliberately set out to actually attract young, high-skilled people into Ireland with the skills that will in turn drive the types of, of enterprises and industry that are, are really important for city development. All right. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? Please. Khaled Rathman here. Interesting presentations. I'm flying out to Dublin tonight. I'm flying out to Dublin tonight. So oh, no, t we'll tomorrow, see. tomorrow. I am. Oh, you are. Oh, <laughs> oh, everything is true. We should take the same flight. Speaking about the investment in the cities rather than the regions, one of the things that we're witnessing here in Saudi Arabia is that there is a little bit of overinvestment in the big cities that, is, that turned it into large metropolitans and became a burden on managing the cities. In your perception, what is the limit? How... What is the balance? How much should we invest in cities versus uh, reversing migration to other territories and suburbs and to, to create or achieve a balanced development over the, on a country level rather than focusing the investment on a city, city level? Riyadh became, is, Riyadh is approaching 7 million now. Yeah. And it was only 2 million like 10 years ago. I, I, I'm not sure there's a, a very clear exact figure. I mean, Ireland is probably quite unique in that we have one city of 1.5 million um, out of a population of 4.6 million. Uh, so by default, almost uh, the vast majority of investment flows into Dublin. Uh, it's where the bulk of our population live and work. Um, and I guess you know that makes it somewhat unique. The, the next largest city is maybe 120,000 people. So it, it's perhaps a, a very different example than than Saudi Arabia, where you have many cities of, of large populations. Um, I guess the key is not so much how much to invest, but what you invest in, you know, making sure that you actually invest in the right infrastructures that build competitive advantage. So in, in, in Dublin's case, that was very much around uh, the airport, making sure we have good access because we're an island nation, uh, making sure that high-speed broadband is, accept is available to the companies who need it in the right areas. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure that I'd put a figure that Dublin versus, or the city versus uh, rural areas. I, I, I'm not sure there's a, an exact balance. Two questions. Uh, the gentleman from Ireland, uh, in terms of the uh, top initiative that uh, you did to be at a high ranking level of the innovation index. And the other question for the gentleman on the ITS, uh, how did you manage to put together, you know, or, or align 45 agencies to work together Sorry. to achieve the vision of the ITS plan. Can you repeat the first question? The, the, the Global Innovation Index in, in Ireland, and I, and I remember it's, uh, they, they achieve almost a ranking of around 50, which is in, in the high uh, uh, quartile. So how did you do that? I, well, first of all, we, we established Science Foundation Ireland, uh, which is a vehicle to actually disperse funding uh, for research and development. Um, so that, that really kick-started a lot of our R&D activity. Um, it provided a base for everything else. It, it set out, sent out the right image as well that Ireland is a location to undertake research and development. Um, it was also about, we had a lot of the right companies in Ireland uh, through our FDI policy. We had a lot of high-tech companies. Originally, they were pro probably based in the manufacturing sector. But we knew that wasn't sustainable you know, as, we, as our economy grew, our cost base grew. So we knew that we had to really transition away from manufacturing towards services which requires investment in R&D and a, a innovative capacity. So between Science Foundation Ireland investments, but also huge change within the university system. Um, we've always had a very highly educated population, but actually focusing third level education and fourth level education on areas of interest to enterprise has been, been quite key. So we have a number of different structures that link enterprise with the university sector. Um, 
I think we still probably have issues around commercialization of a lot of that research. That's maybe a weakness, but in terms of pro providing the skills uh, that enterprise need, I think we're, we're quite strong there. For your question. Um, so basically, uh, we have a lot of agencies involving, involving in our uh, development of the ITS. So basically, uh, as I already said, uh, it was, we had a clear direction, the guideline for the IT services, and assigned specific role to uh, each agency. But at the same time, actually, uh, uh, the Korea, the government was, uh, they play a role as a control tower to entire cooperation between the agencies. And so that's how the Korea actually uh, managed uh, to uh, control the, the, the cooperation between agencies on the ITS services. So, and also the question I gave you, I forgot to answer that the next, the, the next question for how the suge suggestion we can give to the other countries that uh, uh, actually uh, when the government introduced the ITS, the establishment of the ITS should be done gradually after the government formulate the systematic implementation plan and set the standard for the ITS. So those process probably we can, uh, we can give some suggestion on the ITS services or similar policies that you try to set up. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.